Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response, session 96 in our series. Uh, our AI Futures is the title today. Not one, but multiple futures. Which way we're going to go with this is kind of how we decide to frame this particular session. Um, 96, we started these with in response to the pandemic, and then there was one kind of crisis after another following that. There was the the social crisis of 2020 with the Floyd murder, there was the economic crisis, there was the political crisis and the ever pervasive climate crisis, which of course is the really big crisis. And then, well, AI <laughs> could be considered a crisis. We really don't know, but it could, I mean, there are some dire predictions, uh, a lot of them, but we'll see about that. So um, this is a great quote that we picked up from Frank Herbert, uh, the late, great Frank Herbert, author of Dune. Uh, once men, men, he, we used to say it that way, once people turned uh, their thinking over to machines and the hope this would set them free, but in fact, it turned it over to other people who have the machines to enslave them. So it's a good point. Uh, and our first uh, session was, you know, libraries in response to so-called big AI. And that's a, kind of a central concept to dealing with this and understanding it. Whose AI is it and whose AI working for? Them. Our speakers, uh, Lillian, Henry, and Maria, uh, have uh, kindly offered their time and insights and work in this to help us get a better feeling for what AI is, can do, and may mean. So we'll get to them in a moment. We are the Gigabit Libraries Network. This is a 13-year-old uh, consortium of libraries working on interesting activities, uh, technology-related communications, or in this case, uh, AI, uh, anywhere. And uh, one of our primary uh, policy objectives in working with IFLA, who is our host and recording this, uh, has been in uh, towards universal public access. It's not the idea that every home and every person has an internet connection, at least not shouldn't be the responsibility of libraries, but that every community should have a point of access, uh, a no fee, low fee point of entry into the global digital environment, what, which is, of course, what libraries do and do it more than and better than anybody else. And so that's, we think every community should uh, have such a hub uh, for that and a number of other related reasons. Uh, our key sponsor is IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. We thank them so much for their contribution. Uh, and these are other sponsors we have, and we thank them all. Internet Society, uh, Library of Michigan, New Jersey State Library, uh, a couple of media sponsors, Library Journal and Broadband Breakfast. So these are upcoming sessions. Uh, you may have noticed we we took a spring break uh, for the last uh, two, maybe three weeks now. So I uh, hope you missed us, uh, but uh, we're back and we've got programming cranked up here. So one of the things we did just recently was uh, a tribute to Crosby Kemper, the now uh, former head of IMLS. And um, we, we paired that with a, a four year anniversary. So we did 30 minutes of kind of, you know, what we've done over the last four years and 30 minutes of interview with, with Crosby. Well, it didn't do, we felt it didn't really do justice to, to the story of Crosby Kemper. This, this fifth generation Kansas City banker gives that up to become the Kansas City library director. Unusual. And then from there gets involved in uh, broadband policy in, in DC. And then from there uh, is nominated by ALA to take over as the head of a federal agency, which he had no experience doing. He ran a, uh, a, a city library, but, uh, and then suddenly, of course, within two months, it's a pandemic and everything is closed. So here he's running a federal agency out of his basement in Kansas City for two years. <laughs> I, it's a great story. That's that's the point. But what we didn't get were uh, input from others that have known and worked with Crosby. And so that's what we've been doing is doing a few interviews. We're going to put those together with the 30-minute, and we're going to republish that as a redux. So 
stand by for that. Hopefully it'll be very soon. Uh, next to Thursday, uh, we're going to fo focus on the, the media guru, uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan, and how his, his understanding of media and literacy relates to AI literacy. So is AI a medium? That's a question. I'm not sure about that. Uh, the following week, we have Corey Doctorow returning, always popular, always controversial. And then the following week, we'll be actually in Brussels in at the uh, Computer Privacy and Data Protection Conference, which this year uh, focuses on AI. Uh, GLN has been awarded uh, press credentials, so we're going to cover the conference. And we're also going to try to make the point that it's great. I mean, it's essential that that government try to uh, manage and restrain uh, commercial tendencies with this technology, and that there are system controls to be in place, guardrails, and such. But our point is that unless users are actively participating, put another way. Any regime will uh, be undermined by careless or clueless users. So that points to education and training, which points to libraries. And we'll be making that case live in Brussels. They've given us space, and we're going to have a session at our usual time, which in Brussels will be, I think, 1500 uh, UTC. And then uh, from there, we're going to focus on public AI. This is an idea. Uh, that a number of people have been working on uh, a really fascinating notion that should we only rely on Amazon and Google and Microsoft, much less Facebook to provide us with this service? Yeah, no, <laughs> would be my response. Uh, absolutely. If there's another way to do that, of course, a nonprofit doing an open thing would be one way, but th this is really challenging stuff. Perhaps only government has actual resources to provide uh uh, an AI that could be trusted. So it's a fascinating concept and one that would be very relevant to libraries because if you're building this and you apply the principles of libraries, the, the services, the, the openness, the trust factor, all of that, you and use those astounding principles for a public AI, you've got you've gotten a long way. And then after that, we're going to look at this uh, term of polycrisis. I'll touch on that in a minute. Well, right, like right now. So this is our favorite graphic on, uh, you know, what the poor world is up against. Uh, of course, uh, the pandemic was the, the crisis that we launched on. The climate is just getting more and more intense and harder and harder to ignore. Not impossible. It's surprising how, how possible that is actually to ignore by some. Uh, uh, and, and war has even kind of come back on the scene as this something that hadn't really been a global issue until recently. And, and then AI is joining the gang there and the poor world's lamenting the days so of he only had to worry about, it only had to worry about the threat of nuclear annihilation. So try to imagine a, a, a network, a global network of libraries, like the 400,000 public libraries kind of surrounding this globe, kind of holding it together. And that's, that's the vision we're trying to perpetuate. So this polycrisis is, is just uh, the idea that these are not all just kind of things that are happening separately, if simultaneously, but they actually uh, interrelate and they converge and they and they they support each other, as it were. And uh, and this group, the Cascade Institute, has uh, been doing research on this. It's a, it's a fascinating concept, uh, and then they're creating sort of uh, scenarios for positive outcomes, which is welcome. So these are the sessions we've done since since we started on AI. This is, today is like the 10th one. So it's like one out of 10 sessions we've done since the beginning has been AI related and, and easily the most popular since January of 2021. Those are all on the, uh, the Libraries in Response YouTube channel, if you want to check them out, as are all the sessions there on that channel to be found. So um, this is kind of a, a snapshot of trying to get our heads around, our hands on what this is good for, what it means, how to use it, uh, 
so IFLA has developed uh, this strategic response to AI. I highly recommend this document. Uh, that's the title. It's the it's the AI Special Interest Group of of, of IFLA, uh, and this is one of their projects. And it's an extraordinary document. I mean, it's involved. So this is not something you're just going to do in an afternoon. Maybe not at all. A lot of libraries have do not do not begin to have the resources to undertake this kind of a strategic analysis of a complicated technology. But there are a lot of things in there that could be plucked out, uh, and it does kind of underpin uh, this uh, slate project, which we're involved in and we previewed here uh, a few weeks ago. Well, actually, three months ago, uh, we opened it up. So these are state library agencies coping with the same thing. What does it mean? What does it mean to them as state agencies? What does it mean to them as supporters of local libraries? So a lot of big questions. Um, we have a slate member on with us today. I think I saw, I think I saw Kim, uh, welcome. Uh, and then uh, at the local level, you know, the practical use of this stuff in Pottsboro and Diane Connery, the uh, spark plug librarian from a small library is kind of showing the way, you know, you just dive in, you work with it, you do things and you can find benefits. She's built a little front end, you know, for patrons to guide patrons on their initial entry and, and questions that are largely the same and repeating you know, that, that tech support level of things. So here we are, here's one more quote. Some people worried artificial intelligence will make us feel inferior, but then anybody in his right mind should have an inferiority complex every time he looks at a flower. This, I love this. This is, you know, this is the, the natural world is so much more complex and beautiful than anything that uh, people can create. It's just, there was a, a saying, nature at her worst is better than man, you'll forgive me, at his best. And I think that's, I think that's pretty good. So here we are with uh, Lillian, Henry, and Maria, we're gonna we're gonna ask Lillian to lead off, and uh, and introduce herself a little bit. Tell us about what your how you've come to this, Lillian. What you do, and then tell us about what it is that you see AI as a uh, a future that we can actually, this worth building is the way you put it, which is a, it was a fantastic kind of statement. So please back it up. Thank you, uh, Don. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, Don, just to keep in mind, how, how long, I, I want to make sure I'm keeping an eye on the clock. How long do you want me to? 12, 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so um, I'm very excited to to join you and thank you for, for reading the article. And um, I, I tend to think of myself as a techno optimist, although on on some days I think um, some of what we hear um, does make one feel a little bit pessimistic about the world. But um, I come from a background in um, essentially I would I always say community and technology. Um, I'm situated in the city of Los Angeles, um, but have been working at the national level um, for the last ten plus years prior to joining New America, which is still relatively a, a recent role where I'm the Vice President of Technology and Democracy Programs and oversee the Open Technology Institute, which is a tech policy um, institute within New America. Um, I worked for the Knight Foundation, um, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, where I was there, um, Director of National Strategy and Tech Innovation. So I have a history with libraries. Um, and in fact, one of my one of my favorite pre-pandemic stories is my last trip um, uh, before the pandemic was to Miami to um, Knight's Media Forum, where we also co-host um, a library convening every year. Um, and that was where Crosby um, uh, sort of had just been announced um, as uh, head of IMLS. And so we had the pleasure to be one of the first places where he um, where he spoke as head, um, and then we all shut down. And he went to Kansas City and <laughs> started working out of a basement, and so did we. Um, and prior to the Knight Foundation, uh, prior to joining the Knight Foundation, where I launched what we called our resident-centered smart cities approach, 
um, which I can say more about. Um, I worked as the chief data officer for the city of Los Angeles under then Mayor Eric Garcetti, now Ambassador Garcetti, um, and really led the city's um, open data movement, also working closely in, with community and libraries. Um, uh, and really try to figure out a strategy for engaging a city as wide as Los Angeles, as wide as Los Angeles around the use of open data, but then also really trying to transform the culture of city um, government, trying to advance data science and analytics, um, and then um, primarily spend a lot of my time doing something I'm very proud of, which is leading an enterprise data management solution. Um, that still exists called the GeoHub that really allowed us to integrate more than 80% of our data that was geospatial. So um, so that's one thing. And before that, um, uh, like I said, I've spent, uh, I'd spent about 10, 15 years working in policy um, and advocacy roles. I, I led the digital transformation of 211 systems across um, California, um, many of which um, also reside within libraries um, and have also spent time working within um, the labor movement around um, ensuring and stewarding a social safety net that's really strong and robust. So I've had quite a career and a lot of it actually, um, as I was uh, hearing you talk, um, actually has been engaging in and around libraries, which are um, especially at the local level, as you all know, um, such a hub, an important hub and, um, and center for community and, and oftentimes those in need, um, not just of information, but also resources. Um, a lot of what I do at New America right now is thinking about how we stand up a set of programs as we call tech and democ that really look at tech and democracy from a more holistic um, from a more holistic perspective. Um, if you don't know New America, um, I'll say a little bit about, um, about our organization. We're a DC-based think tank, but we're dedicated to renewing, reimagining, and realizing the promise of America, um, especially in this era of rapid technological and social change. Um, uh, we, are, um, we are structured around five you know, clusters of areas of work that range from education to work for, uh, birth to workforce, family economic success. Um, we look at issues of um, democratic reform. We look at international and geopolitics. And then we also um, uh, have our work around technology and democracy, which really is the non security um, tech programming. Um, and then our work is really centered around a vision of a sustainable digital future that advances equitable opportunity, innovation, fundamental rights, and participatory government governance. And so as you can imagine, it's really a technology that enables a democracy, human rights, and allowing our planet to flourish, which is a little bit of where, um, you know, some of the thinking around how we build um, an AI that's really worth pursuing Doing that really supports our public interest. Um, we, we, we talk about our work in three core areas um, within tech and democracy. One is we, um, I, we are working very hard to advance what we call the field of public interest technology. So really focusing on not just the commercial perspectives, but how do we organize technology around a public interest model? Um, and public AI definitely has something to do with that. Um, we also talk about the digital public infrastructure that's needed to support democracy. What are these next generation solutions? For example, as we are all seeing ID management roll out, you know, e-payments, um, data warehousing connected with government um, and services. What are those kinds of digital public infrastructures that we need in place um, in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years um, to really um, have a functioning democracy? Um, and then obviously, how do we ensure that we safeguard that so that it never, um, it doesn't become susceptible um, to, um, to any misuse? Um, and then the last thing we do is we also have a set of programs that are really focused on national and international policy, public policy standards and protocols. Um, and these are meant to ensure that everybody has access to digital technology and their benefits. So we cover a wide range of issues around connectivity, um, uh, privacy and security, trust and safety, as we call it sometimes, and then also um, AI and data. Um, but I'll spend my time talking a little bit about um, uh, AI and um, just, um, I don't have slides, so um, 
hopefully I make this interesting, but I, I guess I would just say that a lot of the inspiration for the article, and I think there's three big lessons that I'll, that I'll go in through is as many of you, I think we've all been down these um, technological hype cycles. And as much as I am a techno optimist, um, at some point you can't help but notice that they are really hype cycles. And there's a couple of just, and, and that there are patterns um, in their wave. Right. And so um so one of the things that started to stand out for me um, is that having lived through in city government, through that kind of smart cities, big data wave, having um, really helped to support and fund a lot of cities across the U.S. around smart cities, and then actually lived through the autonomous vehicle craze, which, you know, was a little bit of a bubble, you know, right pre-pandemic, right? And many of us, many of us all felt that. And then kind of sitting um, in my new role at New America last year, and now all of a sudden being kind of, um, you know, taken over by this wave of AI. It was like, what do these things have in common? Um, and there were, it, it all felt kind of the same. And so, um, so one of the first things I sort of noticed, and I, and I think this, these thing, these three kind of qualities, I think are important to help us feel like we have an ability to take control of the future, because oftentimes in the narrative, it doesn't feel like we can do much. Um, but one thing that I sort of um, observed at is that the timelines have always been wrong. Every single time, a lot of the release of new technology or the promise of next year we'll have autonomous vehicles on the road. I mean, these are real things that executives across, you know, Ford, Chevy, you know, large, right? Um, you know, Microsoft, large institutions, large, well, reputable or, uh, you know, um, businesses have said, but these timelines always end up being wrong. The, the push to launch um, a new product, which chat GPT was, you know, particular bent of autonomous vehicle was, you know, uh, whatever IOT smart city um, device was before that, all of those were really, um, the releases were really it tend to be mostly driven by investor timelines, right? The push to go to a seed round to drive more investment into the product. And what we often find then is um, in the rush to get more money and to push some products out into the market, one, there really isn't the technological readiness within a lot of these solutions um, uh, to actually live up to the hype. And so we started to see that at the end of um, this past year um, and now this year, right? Now we have much more skepticism around open AI and chat GPT. We started to see it actually quite early on. Um, but this was also true of autonomous vehicles. And this was also true of the big data, um, AI, smart cities, IoT, everything is going to be connected hype. At some point, what we realize is the tech is actually really not that ready. And, and then you go through what I always call like the trough of disillusionment, right? Or, uh, you know, this is a, a common refrain on the hype cycle, but then we start that where we actually then get to a place where we become, I think, a little bit much more sober about um, the fact that the technology is important. It is transformational, but at least at the beginning marker of where we are, um, it probably is not going to live to a lot of the hype and, and frankly, even a lot of the fear that's been um, surrounding it. So that's one common theme that um, that that I've personally seen, and a lot of um, and a lot of others have also reflected on. The second theme that we we see in a lot of these deployments is, and I call it, um, I use sort of the commercial term, um, but uh, I call it. There's real no go to market strategy, um, and so I picked it up um, especially after doing a lot of the autonomous. Um, vehicle work at night, where we supported an initiative across five night cities, which happened to be testing natural testing grounds for autonomous com autonomous vehicle companies. Um, that included the city of San Jose, Miami, Detroit, Pittsburgh, and Southern California. Um, and so what we saw there is, so there's this release of the technology, you know, cars are going to be on the road supposedly next year. And again, you know, uh, same thing with um, ChatGPT, it's going to be everywhere, you know, AI is going to power everything. Um, but the reality that we've often found, and I think this is, but this was very clear for me, it's playing out right now with AI, but it was very clear in the AV space is that there really wasn't a go-to-market strategy. And in fact, what ended up happening is the industry had to pivot. Um, and constantly pivot to figure out, well, how is it going to make money off of these cars? 
And so if you rem- if you re- slightly recall, which is, you know feels like six plus years ago, we were all going to have an individual autonomous vehicle. Now the industry is kind of really focused on automating like smaller shuttles um, or um, or really using these individual vehicles mostly for ride share and or the biggest kind of way than autonomous technology is really around trucking um, where they see like that there's more of an opportunity. One, it's safer because these trucks are doing straight long hauls. Um, and two, there's probably a greater need because there's a lot of um, there's a shortage in truck drivers. Um, but the reality is the go-to market strategy is getting shifted every single time. And so when you have a technology that's not ready, that's driven by investor timelines, and it really doesn't have a way to make money, you know that there's still a lot of development in terms of how it's going to be deployed and how um, and how it's going to impact our lives. There's a lot of unknowns. And I, I, I'd I love to you know be in conversation with you all about that, but I feel like that's the same place we are. Um, with AI um, in particular, and you could see some articles towards the end of last year where OpenAI is trying to figure out how to monetize that GPT as an example. Um, and then the third big lesson is most of these technologies, whether it's the smart cities, OTI, um, excuse me, um, smart cities, IoT, I now lead OTI, um, IoT wave or the big data wave, whether it's the AV phase. And I think that this is going to be true for the AI phase. And I talk about this with companies when we're exchanging conversation all the time is we really don't have the underlying digital infrastructure for a lot of these things to scale, um, especially not right now in our country in particular, right? Um, we don't actually have ubiquitous um, connectivity, right? We're still in the midst of rolling out you know, the 50 plus billion dollars of broadband connection um, that would be necessary for every single American to be to be able to have AI powered tools, right? Um, we don't have the, the, the bandwidth, the speeds in the US. Um, and then as we've started to learn, we probably don't have the cloud storage, the data center capacity for like a large scale out of these kinds of solutions. The technology itself is probably going to have to evolve to be more agile. And we also don't have the energy resources to be consuming AI. It's a very taxing um, it's a very taxing um, set of activities. In fact, there was articles in the New York Times around you know, how much um, how much energy, um, AI, you know, like a single AI um, call out to chat GPT would, would require. And at one point it was like small, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the small amount of consumption, but like it would take up all of the energy of like Argentina was the, was the hindsight. So, so what does this mean for all of us? And I'll start to wrap up and can talk you know, more about AI as we go on the conversation. Uh, the big thing is we all have time. I think in a year last year, what we felt like the pressure, what we had to get it right, we have to get regulation, we, got, we actually have more time than, and then the robots are going to kill us. We actually have more time than we think we do. And, we, and, and that is important because it means we have the time to get it right. And as a public interest sector, we have the opportunity. Uh, we don't want to let it go out the barn too far, but we do have an opportunity to come together and figure out what is the AI future we want to see? How do we want to engage with machines? Um, and I think that's kind of on us to like get ourselves together and start doing that work. Um, the other thing is that in the previous kind of ways, there has been little engagement. A lot of the work that we did at Knight Foundation around autonomous vehicles was really in staffing cities to be able to do more public engagement and awareness that these vehicles were out on the road and that people, um, that there was an opportunity for communities to make sense of how these vehicles fit into their mobility um, patterns and interests. We have a more opportunity now to do engagement because the conversation actually kind of blew up so much in the public realm um, around AI that it actually, there's, I, I think the public is much more aware and literate of AI than I would say the smart cities wave or the AV wave or big data or IOT. So this is an opportunity for us to actually do more engagement than we have in the past. Um, and then the third thing I would say that this means for us, since we have time, since we have the ability to engage, is that it does now that we, in some ways, and I hear this a lot, have a little bit of the disenchantment of technology, especially as we're seeing all of these stories of the social ills of the internet, we actually have also the opportunity to come together, government, civil society, partners like libraries and others, to kind of really um, put together our imagination for how this applies to society. 
that these companies have very, you know, simple kind of consumer transactions, um, I feel like that they're thinking about. But AI does have value. Um, this is the technical optimism. There is value and good in all of the scientific technology. And I think there's an opportunity, and this is where some of the public AI conversation is going. Um, and there's a piece that I've been writing and working on about how do we bring scientists, civil society, and government to actually take almost take over the conversation and figure out how we expand our imagination for how we use AI. Right now, we're primarily using a very sophisticated scientific process for chatbots. There's probably more to AI than chatbots. And I think if we could spend more time kind of digging into that um, and how do we use it to solve our large global challenges like climate change, like poverty, um, and like a lot of these sort of inequities within our education, our economic system, I think there's more there. But, um, but right now, a lot of the conversation is this fear. Uh, we have to regulate quickly and don't use it. And I think in some ways that doesn't actually, um, uh, it doesn't actually mirror the reality and it kind of um, limits our ability as a, as a group to actually um, put our heads together and, and imagine a better future. So I'll stop there, Don, and turn it over to you. Fascinating. Uh, thank you for that. That's, uh, uh, that's that's that, that that's great, Lillian. Uh, you make so many interesting points. Uh, the hype cycle, yes, absolutely. So I think the most common analogy that I've heard is the arrival of the web. I mean, some people talk about the arrival of fire, but let's just leave it. You know, the World Wide Web arrived in the '90s. It exploded. It doesn't seem like. I mean, it it was a bubble or people called it a bubble that popped, but we've used a metaphor of like a beer that was poured too fast. It foamed over, but there's still a lot of beer in there and it changed everything. You know, it 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 overhauled how we do commerce and communication and government, e-government, you know, kind of followed that uh, by a few years. And now it's just a pervasive. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's our central communication infrastructure, apps notwithstanding. Uh, but uh, so, how do we take advantage of this time that you say we have? I mean, it's been around, AI has been around, embedded in these systems, and it, we've been experiencing it, whether we realize it or not. It's the, the generative AI, the, you know, the chat application, the consumer level of AI that I think is new. Uh, and so how, how actually do we Take advantage of what, what activities do we need to engage so that we can actually understand its potential, not get caught off guard, you know, the rest of it? What, what do you see actually doing? Yeah, um, well, um, and this is something I'm writing about um, right now. Um, you know, I've been really fascinated with the fact that we, with AI, went down the, the narrative of it's a nuclear weapon. And so for the last six to eight months, I've really been exploring kind of the um, the the opposite of that, which, you know, what if we approached AI like we approached the human genome? Um, and, a, and and one of the more sci the more um, successful scientific efforts was the Human Genome Project. It was a global effort um, led by the U.S. and led by the scientific community. Um, that took about 15 years and cost a little under $4 billion, um, but actually led to um, a financial return on investment that was one to 141. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs have been created. Industries have been um, developed, subfields of, um, of the of, um the kind of genome, uh, the, the gene community and, and, and um, scientific um, subfields have been created. Um, and, and now we don't, um, you know, I was just writing about this, like we take for granted certain things like, you know, non-invasive uh, prenatal tests. I, I have two small kids. So I was reading about it. And I was like, yes, that's all due to the human genome project. And so, so one observation is I think it's interesting that we went down the weaponization route, not something like the human gene route. And then what I've been writing about is as I <clears throat> as I went down the rabbit hole of this kind of effort of, of what it took to bring the human genome project to life and to complete it, um, 
what I saw was a ton of parallels, right, around questions around the ethics of having the human um, genome um, fully um, fully mapped, right? Could that be misused by like healthcare providers, by employers, by insurance companies? So there were ethical questions and they solved for them. There were privacy questions and HIPAA came about. Um, there was questions around how does the private sector who was also in the race to um, figure this out um, also benefit, right? So how do we, the, how did this be? And they figured out how to create a way in which the scientific community would map and would release data on a daily basis. And then the private sector community would use that data and start to release, um, you know, whatever derivative products out of it. So the, the, we may be, there's a part of me that is aware that we may be a little bit beyond, um, beyond the, the point at which the human genome started. Although that effort really was also a reaction to, there's a lot of activity in the private market and this is a public good and we want to make sure that it's used in the right way and that we don't go in um, sort of a non-ethical, non-responsible route. And so they rate the scientific community led by the US reined it back in. Um, and so I have hope, Don, I'm starting to write more about it. I've been going down this rabbit hole that there are still ways at least we've maybe passed a little bit of a point around some of the LLM models, but there's still a way that we can kind of harness back in and say, what if, and this goes to the public AI, what if we built some um, sort of public AI infrastructure that the scientific community could really rally around and build that is of that, that we know what the quality, that we know what the transparency um, is that needs to be there that then would allow us to create you know a more high quality llm that the private sector can use cannot use but at least that we have something to test against and that would allow for more global cooperation because one of the dangers of the weaponization analogy and the route that we are going down in terms of our public policy that we're moving into this kind of horde and and deter others from using right like we don't want others to have as good as AI as us we're going to keep it uh, we're going to hoard chips um, and things like that and I think um, and that's obviously an oversimplification but once we go down that road I think it, I, I think there's actually more probability of um, you know the AI for um, the, the, the AI becomes continues to be much more weaponized, and we lose kind of the opportunity for that promise um, of, of then you know creating the subfields that say how did AI become you know um, you know a, a solution for pro, you know for climate change or whatever. We need to. This is where I say this. We still have time, um, but we we can't just sit on our hands. But we do have time to kind of still rein in and harness. Um, and we have models for when we've done it with very large scale, you know, um, you know, high impact issues. So we have a model out there. Um, it's not like this is the only thing we've ever tackled um, in humanity that, you know, has very kind of existential implications. Um, and we've done it well in the past. And so there's an opportunity to do it well here again. Good, good example. Good reference uh, on that. And also excellent point that it needs to be a global effort. Uh, you know, the internet, <laughs> this is the internet we're talking about. It's just a new yes. aspect of the internet, which is global and and, and you, it just can't be cut off effectively. Uh, well, I don't know, the Chinese are doing a pretty good job of that, but uh, okay, great. So let's move on. I appreciate you uh, mentioning uh, public AI, maybe we can get back to that if we have time. But for now, I would like to uh, ask Henry and Maria to take the floor. And great. Thanks, everyone. And thank, thank, thank you, Henry. Now. Go ahead. Um, all right. So uh, my name is Henry Stokes, and this is Generating the Future, Chat GPT for Workforce Development and Grant Writing. And I'm here with my colleague, Maria Fried. We're from the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. Um, I'll let Maria give her brief intro and then I'll keep going. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. And um, like Lillian, I would consider myself to be a tech optimist too. Henry knows this. Um, and what Henry and I hope to demonstrate now is um, what you mentioned, uh, what has been mentioned already earlier, that consumer level of AI. So thanks again to everybody for giving us your time. 
And just a little bit about my background is I've been with the Texas State Library as a technology consultant for 15 plus years. And so working directly with libraries of all types to on technology support. So from everything from how to how to help them get up to speed with providing uh, a technology hub for their communities and teaching their patrons the most basic of tech all the way up to the emerging technologies and trying to help libraries be that sort of place where patrons can go to learn about them and, and engage with them and feel empowered to use them. All right, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so today um, we're going to talk about kind of what we're seeing with ChatGPT real quick and, and get into what its uses are for libraries, patrons, and then if there's time, discussion. So first off, you know, why why do we feel like this is an important topic right now? Well, obviously there's this digital divide that's been becoming ever more apparent since the pandemic. Um, it's even more so now with AI coming along. We, we see that there's this opportunity here to ensure that we bridge that gap that people are going to have and that we allow people that are normally disenfranchised or uh, cut out of these sorts of technologies to actually get to experience them, them, them experience it for themselves and feel empowered by its use so that they're not shut out from it. Um, we can see there's lots of issues here with, with what the AI divide can do, um, the algorithmic bias, the, the, the whole idea of it of murder, making reality and invention blurred. Um, so we see it as about making safe drivers, basically, that it's not just about using the vehicle, it's about understanding about the whole concept of driving and being able to um, get a larger systems view. So that's why we wanna talk about privacy and 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 security and and just how it works and and about authenticity. And so it's, it's more than just typing in the prompts and seeing what happens, there's a lot to it. So next slide, please. You can see, let's teach them to drive. Um, one of the things we think, just to give a little intro, is we think libraries should, what are the, they can get started by addressing this digital divide, this AI divide, in a really immediate way that provides an impact for the patrons so they can see its value right away. Um, and that's by helping job seekers and small business. So we'll we'll dive more into this in just a second. So, you know, for the library staff themselves, there's a big list, and I'm sure you've heard of a lot of these things that the, the generative AI can do for you, like creating documentation and, and helping you draft different uh, letters and slide decks and coming up with questions. And so, so many different things. We don't have time to go into every one of them, but the whole concept here is you can do more with less. It frees up staff time. Next slide, please. That um, you can then, you know, actually do the, make time for things in your, uh, like working directly with patrons and, and that kind of thing. But one of the areas that I did want to focus on was was its use in grant writing, because it seems like this is such a huge labor intensive activity that's uh, kind of a something that only the privileged can take part of. And yet some of our, especially our small rural libraries really need the, the funding, but aren't don't have the capacity to do it. It takes too much time and, and it itself could cost money just to pay a grant writer to do it. But I also think a lot of the barriers have to do with it being a cognitive barrier, you know, uh, challenge. Like you have to know how to follow the rules of grant writing and know how to present it for the the grant reviewer and and follow all the rules and and um, best communicate your needs and approaches. And that's just not an accessible thing, right? So next slide. So one of the things we think about that could be helpful with generative AI is you have a brainstorming partner, someone that can actually help you create, you know, get through that cognitive load there. Um, because it's pulling from not just, you know, normally you might go on the internet and look and see what people are doing on a similar project and you, you kind of, maybe you can do some research that way and get some ideas. Here it's pulling from the whole internet, with thousands, millions of humans and their ideas. And it's just generating lots of ideas for you. Some of them may be good, some of them may not be good, but it's a lot of ideas that you can then take put in order, help you process what you might be wanting to talk about, even upload documents. So it's just helping you understand the language and give up new ideas that you could include. So I think it's a really helpful tool for that. Next slide. You know, that whole, just that whole blank page problem of, of when you start out, how do you supposed to begin a grant? You know, this way you can actually have a, a helper with you. At, um, the AI can help you level the playing field there. Next slide. And you can see, you know, of course, there's issues. We've already saw this idea that you have to be careful about it and 
it creates hallucinations and makes stuff up uh and that it's just uh you'll have to do you'll have to know what you're doing still so i think there's still some skills that are, that are built in that have to be that people have to be trained on next slide please but then that's what libraries are for so um or other community based institutions that can support people in using this all right next slide so let's talk about patrons maria Thank you, Henry. So uh, now we'll talk about how uh, library patrons, whether they're new to the workforce, changing careers, entrepreneurs or small business owners, how they can use ChatGPT to their advantage. But before we get to some examples, I'd like to ask you to think about this quote from Ginny Ramady, the uh, former CEO of IBM. And she said, some people call this artificial intelligence, but the reality is this technology will enhance us. So instead of artificial intelligence, I think we'll augment our intelligence. So what do you think of Ginny's statement? And um, what are some other ways um, we can, reframing the concept of AI as augmenting human intelligence rather than replacing it, how that challenges traditional ideas of technology's role in society, particularly in terms of um, job displacement, education, or human machine intelligence? And what this makes me think of is at least two types of users and the idea of working smarter. Maybe some users might want to do more faster. Others may want to do less, but still take care of business and, and, and um, take care of what needs to be done. And definitely AI um, would augment or enhance uh, what both types of users already do or what they'd like to do. And this is a chart from the Zoom Work Transformation Summit that was held in January, and it shows how many years it took for these types of products or technology to reach 100 million users. So as you see, it took 16 years for the mobile phone, seven for the internet, and only three months for 100 million users to, uh, to use ChatGPT. And so for me, this confirms what Ginny said. Um, it does seem to show that many people think this tool does enhance their lives in some way. And I wonder how the rapid uh, adoption of ChatGPT, how that might affect other changes um, in how we operate as, as a society. And one last quote I'd like to share with you um, is from the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer of Accenture, Paul Doherty. And he said, the playing field is poised to become a lot more competitive and businesses that don't deploy AI and data to help them innovate in everything they do will be at a disadvantage. So what do you think of this statement and um, the idea of entrepreneurs, businesses, and job seekers future-proofing themselves by keeping up with AI and tech advancements? And what other considerations should we keep in mind um, regarding AI and the workforce? And as you'll see in the upcoming videos, by expanding our patrons' capabilities with AI, uh, this is another way to equip them with those necessary skills to uh, help them thrive in our society that values AI tech and digital proficiency. So uh, now we'll look at an example of how ChatGPT can be used to uh, create a cover letter. And the key to standing out to get a job is the cover letter. Here's how you use chat GPT to automate the process of writing a customized cover letter for the jobs which you want to get. So I've already selected a sample job. Obviously, this is not a job I'm going for, but this is just a sample job. And I've highlighted the text from the job description. I've also highlighted the experience I've had. So what we're going to do is going to come here and we're going to say, write a cover letter to apply for this role. Copy this paste it in here, press enter. And so now we're starting to see how people can really stand out. Now, the one thing I look at as part of every applicant that comes through is their cover letter. Have they spent time to customize something for us, the people that are actually hiring? And some jobs get 500 applications. So the cover letter is key. So now it has now started to write all the things. Now we want to say, we're going to copy our experience and this could be copied from a CV as well and say, update the cover letter to include the following experience. And so now it's starting to integrate the experience I have as part of the application form, as part of the cover letter. This is such a great way to stand out. Now, obviously this is the first kind of attempt. And so the real key with this tool, with chat GPT is to refine it, right? And so we can say, for example, I like this one, rewrite it more conversational and a bit cheeky. 
right? Because now you want to have a bit of personality. And I can tell you that personality stands out from across all the cover letters. So if you can do a cover letter, that's a win. If you can do a cover letter that stands out, that's a bit more cheeky, right? That will actually help you to get the interview. Look at what this tool can come up with, right? This is a customized cover letter, which anyone can do for the job that they want. But it does take a bit of time to select the jobs that you want to apply for and to really spend some time crafting it. Now, one more point that could be like a bit long. We want to say, write it again, but use shorter paragraphs. And again, because sometimes you want it to be super tight and super kind of easy to scan. And we want it to not be big chunks of text all together. And so look at the thing that it's coming up with. This is pretty amazing stuff. This is highly recommended for anyone who's looking to stand out as part of their job hunting process. Okay, so this video, we won't have time to play it. It's 10 minutes long, but Jeff dives even deeper into how um, people can use ChatGPT to uh, create a winning cover letter, uh, improve their resume, and many other tips that I highly recommend if you have a chance to see. Um, you'll prob If you're like me, you'll probably have to view this several times because it's just packed with so much valuable information, but it's definitely worth it if you have time. Okay, now we'll look at an example of uh, creating social media, a social media plan. So what I did here was I asked, I entered on openai.com, um, create 30 social media posts and image suggestions for the Texas State Library and Archives Commission and display it as a table. And in under 30 seconds, it gave me all of this, a month's worth of information, it, it, it tells me um, what I can say, what hashtags use, and even image suggestions. Um, so on openai.com also, um, there's a feature uh, or a tool called Dolly, D-A-L-L-E. -L -L -E, and what I can do is just copy this, one of these image suggestions on the right, paste it into Dolly with any other instructions I have for like if I want the image to look cartoonish, like a Monet painting, futuristic, whatever it is that I'd like. And it will give that to me and I save so much time. I don't have to build anything and I don't have to search for the perfect photo. It's just, it, it gives it to me in seconds. Now I'd like us to, oops, okay. Let's take a look at how we can create a business plan with ChatGPT. So here I made up a business and I uh, added basic information like the business name, the target audience, the product range. And um, in seconds, it creates a business plan for me. Um, but you'll notice that since I didn't give it enough information about my business, there are sections where it gives me tips on the information that I need to beef those sections up. Um, so for example, uh, uh, financial projections. I don't know how to create financial projections for my business plan. Um, so what I did here was I asked ChatGPT to teach me how to create financial projections for my business plan. Um, and it did so. However, as you'll see, um, the level of this, these instructions, it, it's at a much higher level, like an MBA um, professor. So what I did was I then asked it again to teach me or explain it to me in simpler terms, which it did. And as you'll see, it gives me clear, easy instructions and the, the steps that I need to take to gather that missing information for my, uh, to fill in the financial projections before I present my business plan to uh, potential lenders and investors. Okay, so there are many libraries in, in many cities around the, the country that have amazing AI programs for their patrons, but here we'll just highlight a few. And it was Brooklyn Public Library that got Henry and I on our journey to find out what libraries in Texas are doing with AI. Um, and as you see here, uh, they offer ChatGPT classes for uh, resume and cover letter writing. Um, if you'd ever like to um, start one of these classes and, and you'd like a blueprint, I highly recommend reaching out to Brooklyn Public Library. You won't go wrong. Um, they have an excellent program. 
And Austin and Pflugerville uh, Public Libraries, uh, they collaborate with an organization called SCORE, which provides free training to small business owners. And together, they offer workshops that focus on marketing for small businesses and crafting queries to generate useful chat GPT responses. So for example, if an attendee um, doesn't have enough employees, but they need a social media person, with this class, they'll learn to create social media copy using chat GPT. And um, here we have a workshop from Pflugerville Public Library on how entrepreneurs and business owners can learn to use AI to improve their workflow and social media content while saving their time and energy. And uh, Pottsboro Library, which was mentioned earlier in Northeast Texas, um, recently they gave a webinar titled Make Your Life Easier with AI, how AI revolutionizes library services and operations. And not only does this library um, provide several AI programs for their patrons, um, but they also work closely with local nonprofits and, and teach the clients of those organizations how to use AI to write cover letters, resumes, improve a professional communication, and they teach the staff of those nonprofits so that those organizations can teach their future clients. Lastly, we have in Northern Kentucky, uh, the Northern Kentucky Cincinnati metro area, Kenton County Public Library, they have career navigators that use AI to teach job readiness skills. But enough with us speaking, we'd love to hear from you uh, any questions, ideas, concerns um, that you'd like to share. Wonderful. Very nice. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Maria Henrita's. That was a, a, a cram course workshop. <laughs> what what uh, occurred to me was uh, the idea of doing a workshop on grant writing. That could be a really practical thing and it would, you know, Maybe we can talk about doing one on one of these one of these sessions, uh, you know, using AI for grant grant writing. <clears throat> a number of uh, people have commented that it's kind of an escalating situation where people are using AI to apply for things, and then the companies are using AI to identify the applications that have used AI, and you know, uh, to kind of sort them out and discount them. You think that's a danger? Yeah, in fact, that that one that the one that was doing it with the career navigators one slide, a couple slides before they actually have a subscription. We didn't mention this called Job Scan, where it actually it's an AI tool that lets you uh, optimize your resume to a, to bypass the other AI that's trying to, you know, uh, you know, let it in. So in other words, it's it's yeah, AI is talking to AIs like you're talking about. So I, I think it's a real thing. So we'll have to be thinking about that. And and then there's the uh the issue of uh here you can stop sharing right now. Uh there's this issue of who who is AI actually serving? You know, there's the uh the point about who's the first uh the first order of responsibility is the ai primarily responsible to its owner or to its user i mean if we look at the current web we would say well the, you know it's google and facebook and you know microsoft etc uh and that they're often abusing that position or they're leveraging that let's put it that way uh to their own uh to their own benefit so do you think that's a concern? I mean, we can open this up to everybody, Lily and you too. Do you think that's a concern that that we need to be aware of who it is that AI is serving? I mean, they can call it a personal AI, but you know, if it's not actually serving my interests, then I don't think it's really personal. Anybody? Henry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's we have to know who it, it's it's a tool that's being owned by a, a small number of companies here and, and i think we want it to be something that's um open and transparent and um i think we want those are definitely concerns we need to be aware of and go moving forward and educating so, our communities about it too that's the point that's the point uh so do you see this as one of the primary activities of libraries is to help users understand what it is that uh, they're leaving themselves open to or where are the dangers of using AI, you know, benefits, dangers kind of thing? 
literally it's the whole thing work. about learning how teaching people how to drive it's like yeah yeah part of it yeah. is safety yeah 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 and and that's a historic role for libraries and people would would uh they would gravitate that because they've they've been doing that for a long time on various other kinds of literacy in general data literacy media literacy etc so that's that seemed like a a primary activity that's the other part uh Lillian that I thought was interesting today is sort of dividing the conversation to the you know the world of tomorrow that AI could uh transform and the world today where AI might do practical things for libraries and their patrons and I, we heard several practical things that they can do today uh and grant writing being one of those organizing Great slideshows. We we've seen a lot of this kind of thing that are that are be very helpful to a lot of people. Um, uh, we're right at the hour, but I would like to just kind of go around again on this idea about public AI, and the idea that uh, some kind of body or multiple bodies, uh, governmental bodies uh, that could uh, uh, develop something that everybody could use. Uh, as a as an offset for these uh, commercial uh, products that tend to well, if we just watch the evolution of Google search, you can kind of that's the snapshot story right there. It went from fantastic to now you know it's okay, pretty good, but it's now it's getting worse. Packed with ads, guided uh, results, and uh, just less reliable, less objective than I think it used to be. We all were so amazed about it. Uh, 1999 whenever that thing came out so any thoughts on public ai i think we've lost uh lost uh lillian but that's okay one Rick thing that i'd like to share that, that comes to mind for me is uh like even though we have many unanswered questions i can't for help think that uh, whether patrons or, or libraries um, by thinking about whatever if they have a current goal what is that and how they can use AI to their advantage uh, while those questions are being answered um, and focus on um, what goal they have and what's the next step to reach that goal and incorporating AI uh, to their benefit. Um, that's where, and that, that brings me back to being a tech optimist. That, and, and that's why I'm hoping to learn from everybody else. What other concerns are there? Um, so that's what I'd like to add. Okay. All right. Well, that's a good open question. Uh, let's see what is in the chat. I don't see anybody with any questions. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Well, thank you, Lillian. She left us. Great way of getting around people uh transparency <laughs> i take your point uh maria that something's happening today there's functionality there's potentiality and waiting for it to sort of resolve itself before we do anything with it doesn't seem like the smart move you know jumping in with practical you know questions and needs is a way to learn and develop opinions and experience so that you can create something like a strategy. So that I'd like to pose that to both of you, especially as a state library commission in Texas. Do you see some kind of template for creating an AI strategy that you could develop and provide to the, especially to the smaller libraries in the state? At least for me, uh, I think meetings like this uh, will help us figure that out together. Uh, because I, I don't know about anyone else, I'm still learning. Like even though we we just gave you a quick uh, rundown about this topic, I'm still learning about this. I have so much more to learn, and, and meetings like this, we get to um, learn from each other and figure it out together. Um, what do you think? That was aimed at you, Henry. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, 
not much more to add. So you mean if somebody sent you an email and said, we've heard about AI, how should we, how should we go about finding out what it can do for us? I mean, would you give them a checklist or point them to a, a video or what would you do? I mean, I think just, they need to just see it in action. Um, so just getting, I would, I, I think that what I would love to do, like basically a zoom chat with every single library staff member and actually sit them down and, and show them just the basics of how something like chat GPT works and what its potential are. They don't have to go back and use it. I just want them to be aware of it. So they right. understand what it is and how it's happening. Cause I think if we were to survey them, I don't think a lot, I don't think a vast majority of our libraries have, have seen, have even like experienced it yet, especially in the small rural areas. And that's where I really want them to, to get exposure to it. So just that, just that first, I just want them to see that first taste of it. Get that first that's taste. a great point. And, and actually it's a key barrier in one technology after another. You know, it's a thin barrier, but it just, it's opaque, you know? And so if you touch it, you can go right through, but people are reluctant because they can't see through the, the, what they imagine is a real obstacle. So guiding them, hand holding them through that is a really good idea. Uh, let's see, we got something coming in. Kimberly's reminded of the early days of the internet. No, had so much to learn, new things. One of the jobs that uh, people have said, you know, AI represents is uh, AI prompt generator. And then someone else said, well, ask AI to generate the prompts. They do a better job than people do. So it's uh, it's kind of an escalating thing here. Uh, what about licensing? Uh, you mentioned chat GPT. Do you think that there's opportunity for the state agencies to collectively acquire licenses to take a share with the local libraries or have you investigated something like that? We haven't personally, I know slate the group you're part of and we are, is, right. is, is, is at least letting the state library folks have a chance to some of them to play around with it. But no, I haven't heard anything about that. It's an interesting idea, but there could be, I mean, right now it's hard to know which ones and there's so many different ones. Um, so but I, I'm curious to see if hear of other state libraries that would do that sort of thing. Uh, come across any intellectual property and copyright issues? Well, those are happening all the time. So there's currently lawsuits in progress here. So we're still in, in, in the progress. waiting period. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, smaller rural libraries, we really have a, a soft spot for these folks. They're they're out there, you know, trying to do it all for their communities and under-resourced. And yet, you know, everybody's kind of facing the same general stuff. And uh, and they're, uh, this is one of the great things we've always thought about the state library agencies is they they do an extra special job supporting these small libraries. Or say, you know, the big metro systems are pretty well resourced overall, but not so the smaller towns and they need the support. And that's great that you guys are giving them that. We've run over, I apologize, but you know, it's not a TV show. So we, you know, it's not like we have to just drop off. So, but I think we should kind of bring it to a close here. And I want to thank you both for coming in with uh, great content. We hope to have this recording up by tomorrow and we'll send it out as we normally do when we do get it uh, posted on our uh, YouTube channel, along with the other 97 or whatever there are so far. As we move up on a 100 sessions, this is this is surprising to us. We've got nearly 10,000 people have registered for these sessions, and as as many more have watched the the videos after the fact. Now that surprises me, frankly, because I miss a session, I'm on to the next thing. I mean, I don't want to discourage people from doing that. Please, yes, go ahead. But uh, it's it's gratifying that people are finding things that they want to review, like your presentation really bears, uh, you know, watching again and plucking things out of it. So uh, thanks, everybody. And come back and see us. And let's talk about doing that uh, that grant writing workshop. What do you think? Yeah, if, especially if we can find someone who knows how to do like really good. I'm, I don't exactly know if I feel like yeah, okay. yeah. All right. Good, good. Yeah. All right. Well, very good. Thank you both. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. And thanks, everybody else, for coming and participating today. 
So till next time. Have a time. wonderful day. Thank you Thank to you. everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so long.